Welcome, Kimberly, to the Leaders Who Care series. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you for taking the time. I know everybody's busy, but I know, as you said, you're in build mode, so you are spectacularly busy, I'm sure. Um, yeah. So maybe this will be a fun break as well for, for a few minutes to, to chat about it and, and show people that you really are one of the leaders who care. You are, right? I am, most definitely. I thought so. <laughs> so <laughs> let's start by, if you could, we'll get to the business stuff in, in a bit. Just say mm -hmm. who you are, where you're from originally, where you are now, a little bit about, if you want to talk about family, you want to tell us your favorite color, that's cool. So, mm -hmm. Something you never told anybody ever that you want to reveal today. We can do that also. Um, and then we'll go from there. How's that? That sounds great. Um, so my name is Kimberly Bryant. I am the founder and CEO of an organization called Ascend Ventures. Um, that's the organization that I've been spending a lot of time on lately and rebuilding um, a lot of the things that I want to do in this next 10 years of my life, including uh, building the Black Innovation Lab in Memphis, Tennessee. And that is actually where I'm from. I am a native Memphian, uh, born and bred, um, spent most of my formative years in the state of Tennessee, both in um, growing up in Memphis, as well as going to college in Nashville, Tennessee, and then coming back to Tennessee, or I don't know if it's coming back, but staying in Tennessee for the very first um, career job that I had um, as an engineer. So I have a background in electrical engineering, uh, worked in a variety of industries. My very first role as out of college was at EI DuPont in New Johnsonville, Tennessee, um, but really in a hard manufacturing facility. So like a traditional manufacturing chemical industry, went from there to the East Coast, started my time, uh, I want to say my rotation through various pharmaceutical companies and ended up back here in the Bay Area where I am now uh -huh. working at a biotech company called Genentech. Um, where's, but where's your family? My family is kind of spread out. I, I am the quintessential, I want to say middle child. <laughs> so I'm right in the middle of three kids. My younger sister um, is a writer and she is down south in Little Rock, Arkansas. My brother, older brother, is in St. Louis, Missouri, where my mom is as well. But my extended family is kind of spread out um, between Memphis primarily, but along that southern U.S. south uh, region. A lot of my extended family are there, um, but my close family is a little bit um, disconnected all over. I'm the furthest being in California. I know the feeling. My um, my aunt was like my second mom. Turns ninety five tomorrow, and she's in Montreal. And she says, "Man, it used to be so nice when everybody was together in the same town." Mm -hmm. Yeah, I miss having at least uh, my close family being in Memphis, Tennessee, because I at least got to go home more. Um, it's a little bit difficult to do that now when my close family is not there, so I don't get home as much as I would like to, but that will change very quickly <laughs> now that I'm building um, this new venture in, in Memphis. I, I expect to be there quite often. No, that's often awesome. So speaking of family, I guess, what were you like as a kid and a teenager? Were you a, a gadget, got to be the one to try things before anybody else type of girl? Or were you playing music or sports? Did you volunteer yeah. a lot? What were you doing? Yeah, interestingly enough, um, although I have spent the last 10 plus years of my career, like in the tech industry and, you know, really have kind of put some impact and in, in, into the work in the tech industry. And even before my career, I was not a gadget person growing up. I really was more of a girly girl. So I was all into the Barbies, you know, the Barbie cars, the Barbie clothes. I had Barbie parties. Like I was a Barbie girl, a doll girl, you know, so like really into those type of things. Um, but I think it's also like a little bit of, of kind of being pigeonholed into that as well. It wasn't that I wasn't interested in the math and the science. I just wasn't kind of exposed to those things like my brother was. I was kind of really exposed to things that 
were more expected, but like, it wasn't that I didn't like the, you know, hot wheels and the big wheel. I like that stuff. I just did not get the same exposure to them as my um, older brother did. And so I was a bit of a bookworm. So I read lots of things, like lots of books. I was always in the library uh, reading, interestingly enough, like all these autobiographies and biographies of leaders and historical figures. I love that. And I would say I was an athletic. Uh, so I was, <laughs> but not because I didn't want to be. Like, I really wanted to be a good athlete because my older brother was a great athlete. I certainly tried as much as I could, but I was, just don't have that type of athletic ability. I didn't really haven't found anything that I'm really good at other than like golf. And I didn't find that out until I was an adult. I'm pretty good at golf, but I did find it out, you know, growing up because there was certainly no golf course close by for a kid like me in the inner city. It it just wasn't a a possibility. And so instead I was like very musically inclined. So I would say one thing to share, which I don't talk about a lot, but I really was a bit of a child prodigy on the piano. Like when I first started um, learning the piano, I didn't have a piano at home. So I, but I had, and I don't know if people have seen them before, they do have like the keyboard and you can get in like a a cardboard, you know, um, layout of like a piano keyboard. That is how I learned to play the piano initially, like literally playing the notes on a piece of cardboard. And I didn't have a piano because we didn't have a piano at home at that time. And that's how I learned to play piano. And I would go home and like we maybe had a piano you know we had it at school in the band room but I didn't have one at home so I used to take the piece of cardboard home practice the keys and everything and that is how I initially learned to play the piano was from that piece of cardboard Um, but went on to play all the way I wouldn't say until I went to college and I just sort of gave it up unfortunately it's one regret that I have is that I didn't keep playing through college and when I grew up yeah, I know that feeling. So there's got to be a book or movie in that playing music out of cardboard or something. Yeah. You know, I don't that's- know. That's how I play. And it, it's, you know, it's kind of wild when I think about it now. But but then again, not. Because usually when I'm really determined, I'm a learner and I love to learn. And when I'm determined to learn something, you know, like that is like a superpower that I have. And was telling somebody the other day, I was like, yeah, I think this is my third lifetime, if you will, from a career standpoint and doing something completely new and completely different than what I ever did before. And that's sort of been a pattern, recurring pattern for me. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's not a surprise that as a woman and then a black woman, you were not supposed to be doing this or that or that. You're supposed to like dolls. You're supposed to whatever, all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. How ridiculous was that? (laughs) It's pretty ridiculous, but I think for me, it was a little bit lucky in that I'm, I, you know, like I had this really, like I said, I wasn't athletic, but I had a fierce competitive spirit. Like I'm fiercely competitive. So had I had an, I want to say a drop of athletic ability, I probably could have went really far because like I I have a really strong competitive spirit. And so instead of utilizing that in, in, you know, more athletic pursuits and things of that such, that nature, I really focused it on like learning, like being really good at math, really good at science, even going into engineering, like it was not, I did not really want to be an engineer. I kind of went into engineering even because my older brother went into engineering and didn't stay in it. But I was like, I'm not going to drop out of engineering because I'm going to be him at this and nothing yeah, else. Beat him. That was the incentive. <laughs> mm-hmm. It was just, it was, it was all competitiveness. So I well, think you know, that so- has certainly got me on quite a ways in life. Well, again, I'm sure, um, and partly because you had to, and partly because you, you, you were motivated to, I'm sure, also, which we'll kind of get to a little bit. Um, yeah, it's funny, how, you know, people say things happen for a reason. Um, maybe that was supposed to be a reason. I, I'm, I'm not sure, but it sounds like um, you've definitely used your competitiveness, if that's the right word, to um, to move forward. Is Was that your... Was that the reason you took this path of education, getting your bachelor's in electrical engineering and math, 
because your brother was in that or you were you read so much about it that you thought man this could be kind of cool or what yeah no definitely not because i read anything about it i interestingly enough and still even a little bit now i always really want to be a lawyer like i wanted i was I used to watch this show called Perry Mason when I was growing up. Yeah, unfortunately, I know that show too. <laughs> yeah, but I love the show. And like, even now, like I'm one of those weird, I've been to traffic court a couple of times. I love it. Like I love going to traffic court. You don't, and you don't get tickets just to go to traffic court. Right? I do not have a knock on wood. I haven't had a, a traffic ticket in forever. But when I did, you know, I used to love going to traffic court because not even just for myself, but I, I love watching. I love watching the process of the judge and, you know, uh, lawyers coming up, talking about their cases, just being in the courtroom and listening and seeing is it, I weird like that is, is interesting to me. So I always thought I would be a lawyer, but it was like in my high school, well, I want to say my sophomore, junior year for sure, where my guidance counselors were the ones that were um, really the ones that encouraged me to explore engineering primarily, you know, because I had been on this accelerated track in math and science and also other, you know, like English and, and such, but they're like from an accelerated, you know, performer perspective as a young person, you should explore engineering school, going to school for engineering. There was a lot of scholarship opportunities at that time. This was the mid eighties for students right. of color. And so I kind of was, um, I want to say trapped onto this path of going into engineering and STEM fields because of this, uh, I want to say, really strong focus on diversity and inclusion during that time period. And sort of, I, it led me there and I had to kind of experience it for the very first time during my first few years of college. Well, your competitiveness and self-motivation obviously must have worked because you ended up with some relatively well-known companies <laughs> um, between DuPont and Philip Morris and, and Pfizer and Merck and Genentech and Novartis. I mean, name players there. Was that, did you enjoy it? Did you love it? Did you just end up there? Tell us about that. Well, I want to say in each of those settings, I gained something different. Um, that really supported me and the work that I'm doing now or, or all of the impact that I've done throughout my career. So like when I first um, started at DuPont, you know, like a year out of college, that role was what really allowed me to gain um, um, this engineering muscle, if you will, and to learn how to think like an engineer, to learn how to solve problems like an engineer actually in the field. Um, so I, I see DuPont as an engineer's company. Um, that's kind of where you, if you want to learn to do, you know, I want to say traditional engineering practice, that was the perfect company to do that. And it's certainly being, unlike so many of my peers, like really kind of thrown out into the factory floor, like on, on your first day, as soon as you start, like I really learned engineering concepts in practice at at DuPont, that's, that's where I learned. Uh, when I transitioned from there and went into, I wanna say the um, consumer products industry, which was also the tobacco industry, it was a different experience. It's what, where I really learned about production and, and like manufacturing at the product level, like close up and like how important it is to uh, market to your market demographic, all those things I learned being on the factory floor in a very product driven organization. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I think the impact piece came in uh, when I transitioned into the pharmaceutical industry and then the biotech industry. And that has been really significant in the work that I do, which is impact driven. But those companies uh, were so focused and so structurally aligned to these lofty goals and missions around um, patient um, services and, and meeting the needs of the patient and how we were doing things that were socially impactful for the world and, and our patients as well. It kind of led this, that's really the thread that's lingered throughout my career beyond corporate America. So in any of all of those worlds, I learned something 
Um, but all of them have really, I want to say, uniquely prepared me to be an independent entrepreneur and certainly to be a better social entrepreneur. Yeah, it's interesting because uh, the biggest question I get um, in, in, let's say, the search part of our business is when we're talking about um, executives is, um, does an engineer understand um, how to commercialize something or work with somebody to commercialize it? And do the commercializers know how an engineer really works type of thing? Mm -hmm. People might be surprised that, you know, in pharma, especially these days, um, they think, wow, they actually had wanted to make an impact. They really did care type of deal. Yeah, you know? uh, yeah without a doubt. Like what, and I, I mentioned to someone a, a week or so ago it, that my last role was working in biotech and genentech. And when I left that role, I was adamant that I would not work for another corporate uh, company in corporate America again. And it would not be for a negative reason, because that was one of the best experiences that I had in working with a company that had a strong focus on diversity and inclusion and also was so very much aligned to doing good in the world through the work that we did. And it resonated, you know, like when I was there, like it was like this, I don't think that it can get better than this. Like perhaps it can, I'm being just, maybe I was being naive. But in that moment and being in that organization, it felt like the closest to getting to really an ideal experience from a corporate America perspective than any I had experienced before. That's super interesting. Cause you know, we, um, Fifth Element was founded on the basis that leaders in their businesses can do way better when they are doing good at the same time. So I was mm -hmm. going to ask you, how did that corporate experience, but not just that, also being a fellow at both the Pahara Aspen and the Black Ventures Institute's impact your life and also the next chapter to create and develop Black Girls Code? Well, I want to say that um one of the common threads throughout all of my corporate experiences is that I always find myself, found myself in all these different uh, um, experiences very closely wed to the community. So when I started at DuPont, it was in New Johnsonville, Tennessee, very small town in Tennessee. Um, but it was the community connection that I developed in that role and over the five years that I was there that allowed me to really initially start to kind of flex a bit of leadership muscle. So yes, I was a project manager within the facility and eventually uh, a site manager within the site as well, but it was those community events, you know, being a part of the black network, um, the black employee network during that period when I was there, it really became more of a formalized entity and spread to multiple plants. I was a part of those leadership teams that helped us to develop that infrastructure that would many years later, I want to say, transform into these uh, very, I want to say, common e EIR groups that you see in, in many different corporations. But, you know, back in the mid 80s or the end of the 80s, that was kind of a new thing to see those type of formal um, corporate entity groups that were based on a particular demographic and working within that structure. Um, but I learned that leadership skill and began to kind of step out of my day-to-day -day role and be a leader at a broader level because of those experiences. And that I went on to be in those groups at all the companies that I was in, you know, did that at Merck. I did, was a part of the leadership group at Pfizer, um, very, very engaged in the Black Employee Network at Genentech. And all of those experiences, again, they were allowed me to develop certain leadership skills, community building skills, um, collaboration and partnership skills that were not clearly focused on the technical aspects of my, of my job that I was able to take with me when I started my nonprofit organization. I'm back in 2012, but those skills were learned within the corporate setting. And I think about that often that if I had not had those experience within corporate America, I do not believe that I would have been able to scale um, Black Girls Code as quickly and as, as, as um, have such great reach as we did. I think it was absolutely without a doubt all those skills I learned in corporate that helped me to do what I was able to do with that organization. 
Yeah, I, I kind of felt the same way when I joined Deloitte. I didn't wake up saying, man, I want to be a CPA when I get older. That was for mm-hmm. sure. And stuff. So I was supposed to be a professional hockey player. And that's what I really wanted to be. Ah, yeah. <laughs> You're right. The maturity, the the exposure, the everything that you get is a foundation without a doubt. And and then you can take it the rest of the way. You know, the um, you probably know this, the fourth industrial revolution is really about AI, technology, you name it. But the fifth has been said to be about humanity, mm. which is actually half of why we're called the fifth element. Um, the other half is... Um, is um, sustainable development goal number five, which is about women and, and empowerment and stuff like that. But so we focus on the intersection of impact and talent to have sustainable results. And that includes partnerships. So what I wanted to ask you is share with us the value, what we call OmniWins, from strategic relationships that you had with corporate funders, philanthropic, philanthropic donors, educational institutions, government, et cetera, to make both an economic and social impact for business, for their businesses or their or their, fam- or their families and even into the community? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I would say that, you know, I am a firm believer, I believe wholeheartedly that the lifeblood of business is relationships, like business is about relationships. And going back again to my corporate experience and being so beneficial to me is, being a part of those Black employee network groups allowed me to have firsthand experience on partnerships, collaboration, because, you know, I'm working with employees from all over the organization, not just in the engineering department, from every, um, every level, every departmental focus, every discipline. I had to learn how to pull those folks together and cohesively move a plan forward on whatever we were working on, be it recruitment, retention, what have you. I learned those things by being part of those groups and having to build coalitions. And I took that experience with me as I was building Black Girls Code. So when I first was starting to kind of explore this idea of Black Girls Code, you know, back in 2010 and 2011, I wasn't really trying to start a nonprofit. I was really focusing on starting a startup company, some type of health tech startup company. I didn't have a specific idea. I just had a passion. And so I started to like- Got to start somewhere. I started to network, you know, talking to folks and going to networking events and just meeting with as many people as I could. And I kind of stumbled into this need in the tech industry around uh, more women, more girls of color getting access to these skills and these toolkits. I, I just kind of stumbled on that and decided to make a pivot and focus on that. But the very first um, volunteers, the very first um, sponsors, they were all folks that I met when I was networking, just trying to get back into coding myself or learn about the startup um, ecosystem from the developer standpoint. Those folks became our first volunteers and those people that came into those first BGC classes and did the teaching because I had built that network before I needed it. And that was truly powerful because we didn't have anything. Like I started this organization, you know, out of my bank account. So like I had to really rely on the kindness of others. And um, that's how we were able to start those first classes. I didn't have money to pay anybody. We had to use those volunteers and that volunteer is still the volunteers are still a lifeblood of the organization even today but maybe people don't realize it's because that's the only choice we had but it was because of those relationships is how we got started and i would say that's on the individual level from the corporate level um when we started again as i said we didn't have anything but there were two organizations that stepped up and gave us our first start Uh, one was um Google, they were the very first grant we we got in 2012. We weren't even incorporated yet, and they gave me a grant. I, I, I'm still, to this day, I'm a little bit surprised. <laughs> they gave me this grant. I can imagine you know, the feeling. I know. Mean, oh, it, it was an amazing feeling. They gave us this grant, you know, right after our pilot program, and I sort of, like, wrote up the vision of what the organization has certainly well exceeded now, today, 10 plus years later, but at that time, it really just was my um, hairy, audacious goal to build this organization with multiple chapters. It was just a goal and a vision. They funded it, and the interesting thing about that, it was small grant. It was only, like, 
I, I want to say it was no more than fifteen thousand dollars. You know, maybe it was twenty thousand um, dollars, but it wasn't a lot. But it was a lot to us because we that was the first one. We didn't have anything. And the beautiful part of that relationship is that that organization that funded us in 2012 is now um, the organization where our act has funded us to date in many, many, many um, bigger opportunities. So like the virtual program that the organization has now on YouTube, this virtual coding series that was funded via a grant from Google. The New York office sits in the Google building and in the middle of Manhattan, you know, this is prime real estate that is a part of building this relationship over time and their investment and, and bets that they took on us as an organization and continue to help us grow. Um, and I would say last, lastly, and, and perhaps most significantly, when Black Girls Co. started, you know, back in 2012, 2013, that was at the really um, tail end beginnings of this learn to code movement, if you will, and getting kids in, engaged in coding. And someone explained it to me yesterday and I was like, yeah, you're right. But they're like, black girls code really shifted the culture and what we think about when we think about coding and who is the face of coding and being able to do a lot of what we were doing in that growth stage um, allowed us to partner with governmental entities. That was at the um, beginning of the first Obama administration when President Obama was really one of the, the greatest advocates that I've experienced in my lifetime around STEM education and technology. A lot of people from the Bay Area um, that were in the tech industry were part of the Obama one or two administrations. And there was a huge push on these STEM skills and getting more diversity within the technology industry and, and Black Rose Code was a part of that. And I see now that, you know, this whole notion of coding and learning to code is so common. People don't realize that are, you know, in the field now, maybe some don't realize that that wasn't the case like 10 plus years ago. No, no, People no. were just trying to understand the whole lexicon of you know, like, what does coding mean? Like code what? Like is Morse code? And people ask questions like this. Um, but we were a part of that. And I think, again, that um, pays tribute to this notion of building relationships because yeah. we were consistently in the room when these conversations about STEM were being held. Uh, we, uh, we did this thing called South by South Lawn that's sort of like South by Southwest, but it was at the White House. And we were, you know, a part of that and, you know, teaching all these STEM skills and just making it very common. And so I think all of those are just different examples, corporate, governmental, you know, public um, entity, as well as individual um, examples of how these opportunities to collaborate and build relationships can really help ele elevate your work and help you reach your goals. Yeah, I think um, there's a couple of things you said there, that, well, a lot of things you said there were great, but it was interesting. You didn't know why you're necessarily building those relationships, but you knew they were important. Then the economic, you've shown the economic, the social benefits, social impact came together. And if even a fifteen or twenty thousand dollars initial is an endorsement, if nothing else, that this Absolutely. Was real and and took it to the next step. So they realized, you know, that they were gonna give you a shot for lack of a better way of doing it, but they, they're gonna have economic and social impact as well by by doing it. So great for you to to see that. I wanted to move on a little bit to Ascend Ventures Tech. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that you talk about that you look to have generational transformation beyond only coders to ownership of new innovations. I think that's so important. Can you share about that? Yes. Yeah, so like I, I would say that the work that I'm doing with Ascend Ventures and Black Innovation Lab is an extension of the work that I've done over the last 10 years of my career. Um, when I started Black Girls Code, I really had this idea and was putting this idea together, you know, back in 2010 of what it could be. I knew that there was an issue in exposure and access to technology from a skill perspective. So someone asked me a few days ago, like, when did you fall in love with technology? And I was like, yeah, I don't think I ever fell in love with technology. <laughs> I'm not in love with technology. I, I like the power that technology has to help me do things and solve 
problems. And so it's probably one of the most powerful tools in my toolkit. And that's why it's important to me. And so I think from my work with Black Girls Code, it was focused on, I was more so focused on making sure girls from underrepresented communities had that tool in their toolkit. But what I think we did not really accomplish fully um, throughout that organization was not only just giving them these new skills, but teaching them how to now utilize these skills to innovate, to become the innovators, to become the Googles, to become the metas, uh, to become whatever, you know, the next great discovery in climate tech. So not instead of just going to work for these companies. So there's so much focus, even to me now, in, in retrospect, there's a lot of focus on getting kids these coding skills so that they can go into a pipeline and fill jobs. We often talked about like there's 1.4 million STEM related jobs by the year 2040 and we don't we can't fill them. That's great. But like, what about making those jobs? Like who's making the jobs? Because I think I recognize that the greater power is not who is the consumer who makes the um, the widget, Mike, but who comes up with the idea? Who's able to capitalize on that intellectual property? Because that's when we really shift the needle around generational wealth and access is through ownership and being have, having something that you can pass down as a legacy. That's how we shift um, the generation's opportunity and access. And we close this uh, tremendous wealth gap that we see in the world right now. Yeah, so no Go ahead. Uh, yeah, sorry, no doubt. I mean, it's so important. That's why I wanted to, to get that in there. We, we you know, we work a lot with what we call untapped talent. We have a whole mm -hmm. of untapped talent, and and even people who didn't, can't, don't want to go to college. There's a lot of talent out there. Um, we're developing a cybersecurity talent pipeline mm -hmm. with fusion cyber and stuff because, like you said, there's going to be hundreds. There already are hundreds of thousands of jobs available, and it doesn't mean they have to stay in a job. They could do like like we did went to corporate and then do their own innovation. So I'm right. super excited ab about you saying that and talking about it because it's, it's, it's like Google endorsed you. It's, it's a chance for other people to get that type of endorsement also. Um, so I got a couple more questions. You know, one thing we say in LA is you got to leave them wanting more so you can do a sequel and you got to okay. talk about, we may have to do a sequel. All right. All <laughs> um, right. But I do want to ask you about, so we were launched on, um, International Women's Day, five years ago, our firm, um, the other half of the reason we're called Fifth and mm -hmm. at the UN headquarters. So everything we do is about diversity and inclusion. Now belonging is a big thing I, I love. Um, can you describe your journey as a black woman, how you navigated and, and thrived? You've done talked about it a little bit, but but deep down your feelings, your emotions, how you navigated and thrived in these big companies that when you were going through, it wasn't as open as now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, that I would have to say that as a black woman and a role of leadership, who's always sort of been thrust into the role of, as a leader, um, I've had to have a, a wealth of resiliency <laughs> to other to survive. Like, and, and also I want to say self-confidence and self-efficacy. Uh, because there's, it's difficult, you know, like in, in any, I don't know of any field where a black woman is not experiencing some level of bias, you know, especially when we move up the ranks as, as a leader. So being able to create, you know, opportunities, even in my work with Black Girls Code, to build this self-confidence and self-efficacy with the young women that were part of the program was something that was important to me because I knew from my own experience that if you cannot find that self-confidence and that sense of self within yourself, there's going to be you know limited opportunities where you're going to get it from the external fa factors that come your way in, along your journey. So for me, it was that you know, be, and also being able to, like I said, to push through and be resilient through the ups and downs throughout my journey because it hasn't been a straight arrow up at any point it, by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> no, it has not. So the ability to get up literally from failures, you know, to get up, dust myself off and move forward, reinvent myself, you know, change directions, whatever it takes, you know, that's what I've had to do throughout my career. 
And I, I think that's great advice also. Um, knowing that, you know, we always see the athletes winning a championship or the actor doing a movie or the doctor this and that. You see the end, you say, well, and they people are really good, make it look easy, which is why they're really good. But yeah, a whole lot of working out along yeah, the way. Absolutely. absolutely. I, you know, like I was when we were starting the call, I was telling you, like, oh, like it's been busy. And you were like, well, is it good or bad? I was like, well, it's not necessarily good or bad. It's just it is, you know, it is building. I'm in this rebuilding mode and you know, I'm building from the ground up all over again. I hadn't done that for 10 plus years. And that's a lot of work. And you're going to get a lot of no's. Like I, I probably got like two, three no's yesterday, but they were good. And that they really helped me to motivate me. Like I'm not going to lose. Like I'm going to keep going. And I think that level of resilience has been a lifesaver for me. Yeah, they say in sports, I, I'm a sports analogy type of guy. They say in sports, Usually you have to lose a championship game to know how to go about winning a championship mm. And so, like you said, getting knocked down, get up. When it's part of the experience. Kobe Bryant said something brilliant way back when. Um, he said, we're all looking for the dream, which whatever it is to be. And sometimes people are depressed when they don't get to be Oprah or they don't get to be whoever. Yeah. So we're all going, and we should go for the dream. But what you got to realize is this is the dream right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was brilliant. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You gotta you know, take down those moments. So, hey, um, last question, which is really unfortunate because you say some really cool stuff. <laughs> so, um, a client told me in 2021 about 2020. He said, "You know, that was the year that flew by slowly," <laughs> and it was like it was a great expression. And with all that's happened, you know, then the 2022 flew by. 20 every now we're almost. Getting fast. Now you say things are zooming, like zoom. Uh -huh. With all that's happened, can you share with us what you're most grateful for and also what you're most hopeful for? Hmm. Oh, wow. I would say I'm most grateful for, and I never thought I would say this, but like the time to take a pause, right? I reflect and I definitely have been reflecting over this past year and last year a little bit of last year as well that I was running so fast you know during before 20 before March the 15th of 2020 when we had to send everybody <laughs> that day, home that specific day you were running <laughs> yeah like that literally like no joke like literally and I am in a place now where I would say in the last two to three years, I've had to be very focused on slowing down. Like during the, 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 I want to say the heat of the pandemic, it was a forceful slowdown and that, you know, everybody, no one was flying anywhere. I used to be constantly on a plane between the East coast and the West coast, or even out of the United States. Like I was traveling all the time. Um, and I did not really recognize, and probably until 2021, after a, at least a year had passed, how how detrimental that was to my health, my well being, my mental health, all of it. And you know, I'm working from home primarily now, but I I'm one of my passions and my hobbies and my meditations is my garden, and so all throughout the day. You know, I can get a break. If I really need a break, I can go outside, take out my shoes and I can walk in the grass and I can do this thing called grounding, like literally and physically grounding myself and connecting with nature. But that's all about being able to slow down. Like I'm not in an office where I can't walk around on the grass. It focused, it forced me to slow down. And that was a way to really, you know, be more intentional, I think, in, in my work and like, understanding that I don't have to do everything. I don't have to be in every place and I can be a better me and a better leader because of that ability to slow down. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's uh, vital. How about what are you most hopeful for? I the next generation without a doubt. Like I have always been like for a very long time. <laughs> I'm very bullish about Gen Z. Like I I've been bullish about Gen Z because I was so 
I, I think impressed with the young people that were coming through Black Girls Code and the things they cared about and how they showed up about the things that were important to them. And I always thought like, yeah, this is, this is the generation that's gonna change things for the better. And I think with everything that they've been through, you know, it, it's a different world than for them than what it was for me or, or for you when we were growing up, it's a totally different world. But I remain hopeful that this is the generation that is going to lead us all into a better way to live, you know, life on this planet and beyond. Yeah, I'm. I'm uh, I, I I think every era, you know, has the, everybody wants to make a difference. I'm going to make a difference, but I think the urgency and the desire uh, to make the world a better place and and not only make money mm -hmm. is paramount right now. So uh, yes, uh, well, I'm grateful that you're a leader who cares. I'll tell you that. <laughs> well, thank you. Mark. <laughs> and, um, I'm glad you slowed down a little bit and grounding, but. Yeah. Um, but keep making an impact and because with people like you, we can all be hopeful. So, um, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being a supporter. I really, really, really appreciate it. Totally my pleasure.